Professor Kim, Ambassador Kivator, Provost, Vice Presidents, faculty, and dear students. I'm very happy to be here with you. I learned a lot about your university today from stories I heard mainly from President Kim. And I, I will talk to you about the discovery that created a paradigm shift in crystallography. Crystallography is the science of crystals, and it is an old science, more than 100 years old, and uh, I will show you how I have created, with my discovery, a paradigm shift in this uh, science. So, let us start. In the mid-80s, the less light there is, the better you can see. In the mid-80s, there were three surprising discoveries on the structure of matter and its properties. And it came year after year, and all three of them received the Nobel Prize. The first, chronologically, was the discovery of quasi-periodic materials nicknamed quasi-crystals. The name is on the first paper that was published, but not the first paper that was sent. This is a different story. Uh, my name, Dan Schechtman, Ilan Blech, Denis Gratias, and John Kahn. I will tell you about these people later on. And then a year later, 1995, this was the discovery of fullerens by Harry Corto and his colleagues. And a year later, high temperature superconductivity by George Bednors and Alex Muller. Now, when high temperature superconductivity was discovered, everybody was happy. Ah, oh, wonderful, high temperature. So instead of cooling with literal helium, we can cool with liquid nitrogen, which is less expensive and useful. When fullerenes were discovered, there was some objection to the model. Harry Corto told me that there were about six papers against the model, but they were, his model was proven correct. But when we published the paper on discovery of quasi-periodic materials, on the one hand, many, many people joined and started to research the field, and it also met very severe objection from the top of the scientists in the world and I will tell you this story later on. So in order to understand my talk, I will make it very, very simple. And let's define order in crystals, periodicity, and rotational symmetry. Here in front of us, we see a two-dimensional grid. And clearly, you see that it is ordered. What does this mean, ordered? It means that if I ask you to continue this line of dots to this direction or that direction, you know how to do it. You place another dot in exactly the same distance and you continue this forever and each one of you will do exactly the same thing. This is order. You know how to continue this. What about periodicity? Look at this red line. You see that the distances along this red line are identical they come in a periodic fashion. So this is periodicity. And because the structure is periodic, in every direction you will find periodicity. In this direction, in this direction there is periodicity. In this direction there is periodicity. Every direction in this two-dimensional structure, you see periodicity. That's all. What about rotational symmetry? Here we have the same thing, but with a little red handle at the top and I can turn it 90 degrees, and it looks the same. I can turn it 180 degrees, still looks the same. I can turn it to 70 degrees, looks the same, and back 360 degrees, looks the same. And I can do it four times. This is why this structure has a four-fold rotational symmetry. So now we understand something about order, about periodicity, and about rotational symmetry. That's all you need to understand my talk. Let's say a few words about crystallography. Modern crystallography started in 1912 with the seminal work of von Laue, a German scientist, who performed the first X-ray diffraction experiment, 1912. 
This is 110 years ago. Crystals, the crystals that were now studies were ordered and periodic. In all the hundreds of thousands of crystals that were studied during the 70 years from 1912, von Laue, till 1982, the discovery of quasi periodic material, all these materials were found to be ordered and periodic, all of them. Based on these observation, observations, a paradigm was created that all crystals are periodic and the following definition of crystal, the definition of crystal is the basis of the science of crystallography. What field are you in? Crystallography. What do you study? We study crystals. What are crystals? This is the definition. And this definition was accepted by the community of crystallographers and by the scientific community in general. And this was the definition until 1991. A crystal may be defined as, this is a crystal, a solid composed of atoms arranged in a pattern periodic in three dimensions. Very simple, very clear. This is a crystal. Or the same definition, different words from a different book by Barton Masalski. He says the following, atoms in a crystal are arranged in a pattern that repeats itself in three dimensions throughout the internal of the crystal. The same thing, a crystal is order and periodic and life is simple. Crystallography in 1982 can be studied, could be studied by this book by Charles Kittel. I mark something in green, I know you cannot read it, it's too small, so I enlarge it a little bit for you and maybe now you can. He says the following, we can make crystals for molecules which individually, each molecule, can have five-fold rotation axis. But we should not accept the lattice to have five-fold rotation axis. Because in periodic materials, the allowed rotational symmetries are one, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six. This was true, this is true, this is simple mathematics. So five-fold rotation symmetry, no way in periodic crystal. Now, let's, let me show you an example of atoms in diamond. These are carbon atoms in diamond. And this is high resolution electron microscopy. My tool of studies was a transmission electron microscope. I was good in doing studying materials by transmission electron microscopy. So here are uh, atoms in diamond, and you, you can clearly see that it, the structure is ordered, and there is periodicity. There is periodicity in this dimension, in this direction, there is periodicity in this direction, in this di every direction that you choose, you see that it is periodic. The order of carbon atoms in diamond is periodic, and they allow the rotation symmetries are one, two, three, four, and six. Five-fold rotation symmetry, as well as any other symmetry beyond six, is forbidden in periodic structures. That's a fact. This is mathematics. Now, let me take you to the reciprocal space. This is the space where the diffraction exists, and in this case, it's an electron diffraction. And here is an example of an electron diffraction. What happens in electron diffraction, you shine an electron beam onto a specimen, and the, it goes through the specimen, and marks on the screen, it marks a point where the uh, electron hit. But uh, this is the central point, which is a little thicker here. But also, but also, there are many other spots. These are the diffracted beams. There is a diffraction from the crystal in the microscope, and the diffraction tells us a lot about the crystal. We learn a lot from the diffraction about the crystal. But you can clearly see that this crystal is, uh, that this diffraction pattern is periodic because the crystal is periodic. And there is a periodicity in this direction, and there is periodicity in this direction, and in this direction, every direction you choose, there is periodicity because it was taken from a periodic crystal. And the allowed rotation symmetries 
in the diffraction pattern are the same as in the crystal. One, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six is allowed. This is traditional crystallography, and there is nothing new until now. And now, in 1981, there came a new definition for crystal, and the new definition of crystal is the softest definition I have ever seen. It sounds like a poem. Let's read it quietly and see how soft this definition is. It does not say a crystal is, no. It says by crystal we mean any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. And by aperiodic crystal we mean any crystal in which three dimensional lattice periodicity can be considered to be absent. Very soft, very complicated definition. What happened? Why do we need a new definition? And we need a new definition for crystal because of the discovery that I have made. And let's go to the discovery. 1982 was the 70th birth of crystallography. Remember, 1912, 1982, 70th birthday. And this was the year quasi periodic crystals were discovered. And I have made a discovery at the laboratories of National Bureau of Standards. This is in Maryland, in the United States. And I was there on my sabbatical. And I made a discovery shortly after I arrived. I arrived at the end of 1981, and I made a discovery in April of 1982. Along a, a series of experiments that I will explain to you, why did I do that? This is a picture of my logbook, and this is a lesson to the students. You see at the top, it says aluminum, 25 weight percent manganese. This is the material that I was working, and it was rapidly solidified. I worked only on rapidly solidified materials, so I didn't write it down. And the day is April 8, 1982. And this is the afternoon of that day. How do I know? Because the previous page, is the same date, work that I did in the morning on different material. You see the numbers, number 1720 is the plate number in the electron microscopes. I don't know if you have electron microscopes here, and you do, okay, and nowadays you have the results on the computer, of course, but those days we took pictures, real pictures, on slides made of glass glass slides, something like this, and we had to develop them and fix them and print them. There was a whole operation. Of course, nowadays, it goes directly to the computer, and a minute later, you can never print out. But those were days in which you had really had to cook all the experiments very slowly. And 1720 is a plate number. SAD is selected area diffraction. It's a diffraction pattern. SAD. And it took another one, and then uh, 1722, it, it says 28K, 28,000 times magnification. K is 1,000. And so on and so forth. What can we learn from this picture? Number one, when you make an experiment, write it down in a logbook. Make sure that you write down every experiment that you do because sometimes you need to remember it years after you've done it, and if you don't write it down, you may remember your experiment for one week, but then it's gone. So here is an example of something taken 1982, many, many years ago, and it's still live like it is today. Write down your experiment in a logbook. This is, by the way, an official logbook of the United States government for a laboratory. Okay, and then let's go on, and um, then I have uh, picture number 1724, magnification 36,000 times. I look at this picture and I said, hmm, that's interesting. What's going on here? And I show you the picture, and I will tell you what is interesting there. And then I say, well, I must take a diffraction pattern. I take a diffraction pattern, plate number 1725, and I count, as I will show you, 
and I write tenfold, tenfold rotation symmetry? Cannot be. One, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six. And then I said, mm, I think I know what it is, and I will tell you what, and I continued for that afternoon with experiments to find out what I thought. For those of you who are in materials may know what twins are. Twins are defects in the structure, and the twin boundary is a very special boundary between two grains that are oriented in a special angle. These are twins. And I was trying to find the twins, but I will talk about it later. Okay, enough of this. And this is the discovery. This is it. And only rarely you can pinpoint a minute of discovery through the logbook to a date, the afternoon of that day. This is like three o'clock on that day. Let's go on. This is Archimedes. When Archimedes discovered his law of Archimedes, legend tells us that he was jumping out of the bathtub shouting, Eureka! We don't do that anymore. <laughs> First of all, who takes a bath? Who has time for baths? Most of us take showers. Only people of leisure have time to take baths. But today, when you make a discovery, usually the reaction is, hey, What's going on here? This is interesting. This is the beginning of discovery. This is the reaction of most scientists when they make a very interesting discovery. That's interesting. What's going on here? Okay. Now, this is the first view of the icosahedral phase. I will explain to you later why I called it the icosahedral phase. But this was the picture that I said this is interesting. So what is interesting here? I will explain. What you see is, um, you see crystals uh, in this material of aluminum 25 weight percent manganese. And some of the crystals, those on the left for instance, are pitch black. When a crystal is pitch black, and this is a bright field image taken through the transmitted beam, it means that the transmitted beam has almost no intensity. So where did the intensity go? It goes to the diffracted beams. So I have never seen before that date such a black crystal in my career. And I was a veteran electron microscopy. I was pretty good at it. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. This is the discovery. And then I said, I'll take a diffraction pattern for one of these black crystals. And I took a diffraction pattern, as you have seen on my logbook, and wow, this is a diffraction pattern. So this is electron diffraction from the icosahedral phase. It has five-fold rotation axis, not ten-fold, although it seems ten here, but exactly, you count them. This is exactly what I did. I started to count them, and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten? No, 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 cannot be. One, two, three, four, five, tenfold, and I write tenfold in my logbook. But not only that, also periodicity had disappeared. There's no periodicity. And the ratios of distances are later on uh, come from theory. And the ratio of distances between the central spot and the other spot in the, is the Fibonacci number tau. Fibonacci number tau. You have to know about Fibonacci. I will talk about him a little bit. Tau or phi, known also as the golden mean. And this is the golden mean. It's an irrational number. One plus root five divided by two. 1.618, an endless number of digits beyond that. And this is the Fibonacci number. Now, you cannot measure and arrive at this number because it's an irrational number. This came later on from theory. For measurements, you can come close to this. So this was a surprising diffraction uh, pattern. By the way, this is the original pattern. I didn't, I took many more later on, but this is the original one. Look at the quality. It's very, very high quality electron diffraction. Now, this diffraction pattern was not the only one. You know, if this is a specimen, I can tilt it and I can rotate it in the electron microscope. 
and have diffraction patterns from all angles. And if you look from the down, down right, you see fivefold, twofold, and fivefold again, and sideways, five, three, two, five. Now, twofold and threefold are allowed in periodic materials and also in quasi periodic. Fivefold is not allowed. But why did they call it dicosaidal phase? Because this order and angles between the orientations has an icosahedral symmetry. I will talk about icosahedral symmetry in a few minutes. Okay, this is what I thought I have. These are twins, not in quasi-periodic materials, these are twins in diamond. But on the right you see five-fold twin. These are five crystals that meet in a very special angle and you can count them, there are five of them. And the sigma notation, forget about the sigma numbers, they're not important now. Now, if you look at, if you look at the crystal at the top and the crystal on the right, then they are rotated 72 degrees to each other. 360 divided by five, 72 degrees. And then 72 degrees again and again and again. Now, if you take a diffraction pattern for one of these crystals, one of them only, you will have a periodic diffraction pattern because it's a periodic structure, diamond. But if you take a diffraction from all five of them together, then you have five superimposed diffraction patterns. One, two, three, four, five, 72 degrees to each other, and the diffraction will have diffraction pattern will have five fold rotation symmetry because it's a combination of five diffraction patterns. As of course, it will have five fold rotation symmetry, but it doesn't come from one crystal. It comes from five crystals. This is exactly what I thought when I saw the picture. I said these are twins because these pictures I taken years before. I knew about five fold rotational twins. I spent the whole afternoon trying to find the twins, and this is on my logbook. I did every experiment I could. I could not find the twins. There were no twins there. Okay, so now we have a structure that have a five-fold rotation symmetry diffraction pattern and no twins. I knew for sure. Okay. I will tell you later on what happened between the day of the discovery to the day of the publication. This is two years different. 1982 discovery, 1984. First paper was written by myself and Ilan Blech. Ilan Blech was a professor at the Technion at the time, a very good scientist, and he was the first person who was interested in working with me. And he proposed a model that would explain how such materials could have been created. And together, we wrote a paper. This is the paper, the Sheikh Mablech paper. And uh, again, this, uh, this was again the summer of 1994, and I came back to NBS. Every year I came back for the summer to NBS. And from there, I sent the paper to Journal of Applied Physics. Those days, those days, you, you may find it funny. Professors could not type. We had typists at the office to type our articles. We wrote them by hand, they typed it. We corrected it, they typed it again. We corrected it again, they typed it again, every time from scratch. There was no way to, like today computer, there were no computers. On the typing machine. Finally, we agreed that this is the last version, I put the paper, actual paper, in an envelope, write the address, Journal of Applied Physics, put a stem, close it, and send it by mail to Journal of Applied Physics. A few weeks later, I received an envelope from the Journal of Applied Physics, and the envelope contained the paper that I sent with a letter that says approximately the following. Dear Dr. Schechtman, thank you very much for your contribution. We decided not to send it to peer review because we think that it will not be interesting for the community of physicists. Okay. So I took the paper 
and showed it, showed the rejected paper to my host. My host's name was John Kahn, and I will talk about him later on. And John Kahn said, Danny, we have something fantastic here. Let's send a different paper for quick publication. And this is the second paper that was sent shortly thereafter to PRL. PRL is Physical Review Letters. We wrote only my findings of the first day. No model of Ilan Blech, no everything. And John invited another fellow from France. His name is Denis Gratias. He was a mathematical crystallographer. Just to confirm that what I'm talking, John did not understand crystallography. He was a thermodynamic person. Just to confirm that I'm OK, he said OK, and we sent the paper. I insisted that Ilan Blech would be on the paper, although his contribution was not included. <coughs> We sent it to PRL, it was published in a couple of weeks, and boom, hell broke loose. We started to get, I started to get telephone number, telephone calls and uh, emails and so on from all over the world. Danny, this is fantastic. Everybody could reproduce my results within a couple of days because I explained exactly what I did. And anybody who could rapidly solidify the material could prepare it, put it in the microscope, poop, exactly the same result. And a large community of thousands of scientists grew very quickly to investigate and to investigate the quasi-periodic materials. They took my discovery and uh, it turned it into a very thriving, active uh, science and published many more than 10,000 papers and made the, and discovered quasi-periodic materials in many, many other materials, maybe a hundred or more um, alloys could be quasi-periodic. So this is the second uh, paper that was published first, and then my, the first paper was sent later on to Metallurgical Transactions, it's another journal. They published it, but they published it half a year later, so the first paper was published second after the first paper. Okay, and now a little bit of stories. This is an icosahedron. Icosahedron is a platonic body, and it has exactly the same symmetry as the diffraction pattern. The angles between the poles is exactly like in a diffraction pattern. So what does it mean? It means if you put your eye up there on top and look down, you see five-fold rotation symmetry. And there is one more five-fold on the right and more and more. There are several five-fold rotation symmetries. If you look straight on, you see three-fold rotation symmetry. And there are several of these. And all in all, there are six five-fold axes, ten three-fold axes, and 15 two-fold axes, exactly like in the diffraction pattern. This is why we call the phase the icosahedral phase. Now, the main rotation symmetries of the icosahedron can appear also on the football. I, I am sure that here in Korea, some of uh, your cities have very good uh, football teams or soccer teams, whatever you call it. And, but I promise you one thing. They don't know that they play with icosahedral symmetry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so enough of this and let us uh, continue. Now I would like to talk to you about quasi-periodicity. What is quasi-periodicity? We didn't mention anything about it yet. And in order to understand quasi-periodicity, we have to start with quasi-periodicity in one dimension. Later on we'll have two dimensions and three dimensions. The master of mathematics who created quasi-periodicity in one direction is Leonardo Fibonacci de Pisa. And this is his drawing, this is how he looks like. And this is a statue that he raised on his for his, in his memory. And you can see the statue, if you ever go to see the inclined power of Pisa, maybe some of you have been there, just beyond, just beyond the inclined tower, maybe 50 meters beyond, 
with a graveyard, very small, under a roof. And uh, this statue is, is there. Say hello for me if you visit. So this is Leonardo. So what did Leonardo uh, Fibonacci did? Leonardo Fibonacci created the rabbit's experiments. And I will explain to you, this is fun, real fun. Look at the top. Let's say that in, this is all Fibonacci. Let's say that in the first month, we have one female rabbit. This female rabbit can give birth to a little one every month. So in the second month, we have the, the same mother rabbit and the little one. In the third one, we have the same mother that gives birth to a little one, but the little one from the second month has to grow before it can reproduce, so it grows. In the fourth month, we have mother, baby, mother, mother, baby, and so on and so forth. If you know the rules, you can continue this. I stopped because this was the end of the page. Now, if you look on the left, you see the numbers. One rabbit, two rabbit, three, five, eight, 13, 21. These are called Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers have certain qualities, and these are the two qualities. Number one, every number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So an equals an minus one plus an minus two. Also, if you go to infinity, to the end of this line, then if you divide the last line by the previous line, you will get a n, which is the last one, divided by a n minus one, you get this irrational number, which is the Fibonacci number tau. One plus two, five divided by two. But what is quasi periodicity? Okay, let us look at the last line of rabbits that I drew, the one with 21 rabbits. First of all, there is order. What does it mean there is order? It means that if you ask you to continue this line, and you remember that every, every grown-up rabbit can give birth every month, and every little one has one month to grow before it can reproduce, if you remember this, then each one of you will do exactly the same thing. This is order. There is order there. You know how to do it. If you don't make mistakes, they will all look the same. But there is no periodicity. If you look at the last nine, you see that there is no this order, but no periodicity. Large rabbit, small. Large, large, small. Large, small. Large, large, small. Large, large, small. Large, small. Large, large, small. There is no periodicity at all. This is quasi-periodic order in one dimension, along a line. Okay, quasi-periodicity in one dimension. Okay. And he published it in the year 1202 in a book called Liber Abaci, the book of Abacus or the book of mathematics. What about quasi-periodicity in two dimensions? The discovery of this belongs to Penrose. Penrose is a, an amazing scientist who lives in England, and a couple of years ago he received the Nobel Prize for his work. Roger Penrose, a dear friend, and he created the Penrose tiles. These are two tiles, two rhombi, 72 degrees and 36 degrees. If you join them together according to certain matching rules, according to certain order, you create this. You can tile a floor with no gaps, but this is quasi-periodic. There is no motif that repeats itself periodically. It's quasi-periodicity in two dimensions along a plane. And this belongs to Penrose. What about quasi-periodicity in three dimensions? Well, this is quasi-periodic materials. These are the crystals that I have discovered, and in this picture you see a very nice five-fold axis in each direction. This is in the magnesium zinc cerium system. Okay, now being uh, gifted students as you are, and gifted professors of course also, I would like to show you something very interesting which is called the cut and project. What is cut and project? Cut and project is a method to take 
a high dimensional periodic structure, make a cut and project it, and create a lower dimension quasi-periodic order. You don't have to understand what I said, but after I will explain to you, you will. So, here is a high dimensional periodic order. How high? Two dimensions. Two dimensional periodic order. Let's say that in each intersection, each intersection, there is a mathematical point, a point without dimensions. Now we send a strip. This is called a cut. So we send this cut by doing the following. We start at two points at the bottom, and then we send it up to angle alpha, but alpha is not just any angle. Alpha is such that the tangent alpha is a Fibonacci number. It's an irrational number. What does it mean? Pay attention to this. This is beautiful. It means that if I started from a point at the bottom, the line will never ever meet any other point. Why so? Let's say that it met one point. Then the tangent will be this divided by this, which is a racial number. But no, I sent it in an irrational direction. It means that this line or two lines, each of these lines will never ever meet any other point. And now I pick all the points that are inside, all these. And I project them onto a lower line. Whoops, projections. Now, if you look and start to count from the bottom, you will see and measure the distances, you'll see. Do we have a laser beam here on this, by the way? No, no laser beam? Okay. No. Okay, if you look from down at the bottom, you see that there is large, 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 small distance. Large, large, small. Large, small, large, large, small, and so on. Along the line, there is a Fibonacci sequence. So what did I do? I took a two-dimensional grid, periodic, made a cut and projection, and created a one-dimensional grid, which is quasi-periodic. From two dimensions to one dimension. You can take a six-dimensional space, cut and project it onto a three-dimensional space, and you will create a new quasi-periodic order in three dimensions. Mathematicians do it just like this. Okay. So this is the cut and project, and now we'll, conti we'll continue to something even more interesting. I do the same. And remember, alpha, alpha was, tangent of alpha was one plus root five divided by two, the Fibonacci number, and this creates a quasi-periodic order. Now I bring in red. Now, the red lines meet the first point here, down here, and up there also another point. I made it meet that point. And now the tangent is a rational number because this is this divided by this. And in this particular case, this is 11 divided by seven. Okay. 11 divided by 7, the ratio number. Is it close to being quasi-periodic? Yes. But is it there? No. It's approximately there. Now, look at these two points. This is the periodicity. One at the bottom, one there, and then you can go up, 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 and you see the periodicity. This is like a structure with very large unit cell. It is called approximants. There are many materials that exist that are approximants. They are approximately quasi-periodic, but not quite. Now, later on, I will come back to this and explain to you what was the mistake of my opponents. Because they were talking about approximants, and approximants can never be quasi-periodic, because they are periodic. Okay. And now to the stories, enough science, now story. 1982 was the year of the discovery, 1984 was the year of publication, first publication. Now, <clears throat> after the discovery, I started to talk to everybody in the laboratory at NBS, National Bureau of Standards, 
who was willing to listen to me, and the reaction was varied. The good reaction came from John Kahn, for instance, my host. John said, Danny, this material is telling us something, and I challenge you to find out what it is. He didn't solve the problem, but he encouraged me to solve it. This was an example of good reaction. Now an example of bad reaction. My group leader was an administrative group leader. I didn't, have, I didn't do science with him. But I reported to his secretary. He came to my office one day, smiling sheepishly, putting a book on my desk, and the book name is X-ray crystallography. And he says, dear Dr. Schechtman, please read this book, and you will understand that what you are talking about cannot be. I said, you know, doctor, I know this book. I teach at the Technion. I don't need to read this book. I'm telling you, my material is not in the book. Took the book back, and a day later, he comes to my office and said, Dr. Schechtman, I cannot have my name associated with your name. I want you to leave my group. So I left. But it didn't mean anything practical. It just I had to find another group that adopted the scientific orphan, and I found it within a few hours. They adopted me, and instead of reporting to his secretary, I reported to that secretary, end of crisis. But this was the reaction, the other side of reaction. Everybody else was somewhere in between, believing, not believing. But let me tell you something, guys. If you believe only what's in the books, you belong in religion not in science. In science, we rewrite the books. Yes, we base our knowledge on books, but our aim is to rewrite the book, create something that will force you to rewrite the book because what's written there is not true anymore. This is science, rewriting the books. Okay, enough of this. This was 1984. And this was how I felt during that period of time walking like the cats in front of all these bulldogs. <coughs> okay, so this was that period. 1994, 1997. 1984, there was publication already. And many, many people joined us, as I said, but the International Union of Crystallography, this is the body, the official body, that decides what's right and what's wrong in crystallography, they said, we do not believe in diffraction patterns taken by an electron microscope. We need X-ray diffraction patterns. Single crystal X-ray diffraction patterns. We could not have them because our crystals were still very small. And those days in synchrotrons, we did not have microbeams of X-rays. So we could not do it. But in 1987, friends of mine in Japan and in France managed to find stable quasi-periodic crystal and they could grow very large crystal. How large? This size crystal, any size you want. And then they took diffraction patterns. And in 1987, I took their diffraction patterns and brought it with me to a conference of the International Union of Crystallography in Perth. Perth is West Australia. And when I'll show you the pictures, when I show these pictures of X-ray diffraction, fivefold, threefold, twofold, everybody said, okay, Danny, now you're talking. And they created a committee that accepted quasi-periodic materials into the realm of crystallography, and now we have periodic crystals, and we have quasi-periodic crystals, but we learn one thing. If somebody comes now and say, I found a third type of order, we listen. We don't reject. We listen, we check, we observe. We don't reject like this. Okay, so this was 1987. 
So you think, okay, big deal. Now that the International Union of Crystallography accepts what's the periodic materials, who will object? Not so fast. Because then there was Professor Linus Pauling. Now, Professor Linus Pauling was arguably the greatest chemist in the United States in the 20th century. He was not only the father of the American Chemical Society, he was also the godfather of the American Chemical Society. And he was a well-appreciated scientist. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and he won again the Nobel Prize in Peace for working against proliferation of nuclear weapons. So he was really a very dominant scientist. But the difference between Linus Pauling and God is that God doesn't think that he's Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, however, had different ideas. And he thought that he really understood everything. We had long discussions by writing, by phone, and we met twice. Uh, he was standing on stages, he was loved by, by everybody in the Chemical Society of the United States, and he was saying, there are no quasi-crystals, there's quasi-scientists, and a thousand people cheer. But he was wrong. And later on, I will explain to you what was wrong in his ideas. So the main objection of quasi periodic came from Professor Linus Pauling. Uh, he was born in 1901, 1901, died in 1994 at the age of 93. And he was a distinguished American scientist, two-time Nobel laureate, as I said. During the last decade of his life, for 10 years, he was working against quasi-periodic material, trying to prove that QCs, quasi-periodic material, can quasi crystals are really just twinned periodic crystals. I knew from day one that there were no twins there. But he was X-ray crystallography, and I was an electron microscopist, and he could not see it by X-ray crystallography. He could not see that there are no twins there. So this was uh, the story with Linus Pauling. Now, I met him once in a dinner in, of the, I think it was American Physical Society that gave me a prize for new materials, so we had dinner one-on-one, -on -one, and every, everybody was looking for the feast, but no feast, we were very polite to each other. Uh, and although he was born in New York, he had sort of southern manners, so. And it was very interesting conversation. We agreed about everything, including vitamin C. He was proponent of vitamin C. Linus Pauling ate 15 grams of vitamin C every day, like food. I take, I take one gram every day. We agreed even on that. And uh, the second time, I met him in his home in Palo Alto, California. He has a center, was called the Linus Pauling Research Center, which was really his home. And I gave him a talk for one person. There was one person, and I gave a talk to him, one hour. Something like this talk here, with a little bit more details. And at the end of one hour, he said, Dr. Schechtman, I don't know how you do that. Of course he didn't know, because he was not an electromicroscopist. I said to him, Professor Pauling, if you ever agree with me, please don't keep it a secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the last time we talked, and then a few years later, he died. So that was the main objection. I want to start summing up my uh, talk, and this is not the end yet. <coughs> Seminal contribution. Roger Penrose, I mentioned to you. Ellen Mackay is the greatest crystallographer I know, also alive today, also in England. He's really an innovative crystallographer, and he sort of predicted that quasi-periodic materials will exist after observing Penrose tiles. Ilan Blech, Denis Gratis, and John Kahn are my fellows that wrote the face papers with me. And Dov Levine and Paul Steinhardt proposed a mathematical model of quasi periodic material. These are seminal contributions. Now, let me show you the enthusiasm we had 
during the first year of quasi-periodic materials. And in order to demonstrate it, I'll show this graph. <clears throat> this graph was written by hand on a piece of paper by a colleague of mine named Bob Schaefer. He died a few years ago. And he brought it to lunch. And I confiscated it for him. Otherwise, he would throw it to the bin. But I confiscated it for him. And this is very, very beautiful. What does it say? N at the top is number of pages in the bibliography. We hired a secretary that collected all the papers from around the world, actual papers, and created a library of all the papers, quasi-periodic materials that were ever published. And Bob Schaefer <coughs> counted the number of pages, N. And on the left, you see one over N. So when one over N is 0.1, that means 10 pages, okay, and so on and so forth. And he did it until July, number seven at the bottom, until July of 1986. And I was there in July, and this was dinner, I'm sorry, lunch in July. And as a good scientist, he connected all the X's to the bottom, and he found out to our horror that in December of 1986, the number of papers on quasi-periodic crystals will reach infinity. Here's the proof. Well, it didn't happen, but the feeling was that, wow, the world is really exploding with activity. Okay, <clears throat> I want to continue summing up. Order. Well, as before, order was synonym, order in crystals, was synonym to periodicity, now we know that there is periodicity and there is quasi-periodicity, and this is fine. And as I mentioned before, are there other kinds of order? Maybe, maybe you will find one. Okay, we will listen when you tell us. And now I want to answer a question that you did not ask. And the question is, why quasi-periodic crystals were never discovered before 1982? 70 years of crystallography. Thousands upon thousands of crystallographers investigated hundreds of thousands of crystals around the world and nobody discovers quasi-periodic material. <coughs> Why did it have to wait for me? Maybe because they're very rare and I happen to find one. Maybe they're not stable. You touch them, they disintegrate. Maybe they're difficult to make. And I, with my magic fingers, made one. <laughs> Maybe they are made of rare elements. Presidinium, gadolinium, and a touch of zinc. Maybe. Well, let's answer these questions. Are they rare? No, they are not rare. There are hundreds of them. There are very many. Here is an example of composition based on aluminum alone in which you can find quasi-periodic crystals. They are not rare at all. This is not the reason why they were not found. Are they not stable? Many are indeed not stable and transform to periodic structure at high temperature. If you heat them up to high temperature, they will transform to periodic structures. But quasi-periodic crystals can be thermodynamically stable. And here are a few examples, there are many more. If they are thermodynamically stable, it means that you can heat them up until they melt. You cool them slowly down, they are quasi-periodic. Okay. Maybe they are difficult to make? Not at all. They are very easy to make. They can make the, you, you can make them by casting, by rapid solidification, by single crystal growth, by electrical deposition, CVD, PVD. Any method that you prepare materials, metallic alloys, you can prepare quasi-periodic materials. Easy. Are they made of rare elements? Not at all. They're made of iron, aluminum, chromium, copper, titanium. Millions of tons of these elements are used every year. They're very abundant materials. They're no rare material at all, very common. So why quasi-periodic crystals were never discovered before 1982? I'll give you now my answer. Up to now, everything was objective. Now, it's subjective. I think that this is the reason. Number one. Quasi-periodic materials had to be discovered by TM. TM is transmission electron microscopy because they were very small. 
with x-rays, you will get rings, but you miss the rotation symmetry. You need single crystal diffraction pattern, and at the time, it was only possible by transmission electron microscopy, and I was a transmitter electron microscopist, and I was a good one. So you say, okay, Danny, you're a good one, that's very nice, but there are many, many like you who do transmission electron microscopy around the world. Why you? Well, you also have to be a professional, and you have to be an electron microscopy who can teach electron microscopy to graduate students as I did, both theory and practice. I was pretty good at that. You also have to know how to prepare the, to prepare the specimen. Specimen preparation for electron microscopy of complex structure is not easy. You have to develop technology to do that, and I did that. So I was a professional. All right, but that's not enough. You have to have tenacity. Tenacity meaning that if you find something, don't let it go. Be like a Rottweiler dog. You bite, you don't let go. This is tenacity, and I was like that. You have to believe in yourself. Professor Pelling said, Pelling said you're talking nonsense. Some people will fold and go home. Not me. Not me. I believe in myself. I am a professional, Professor Pauling. And if you want to contradict me, repeat my experiment, show me what's wrong. If you want to contradict theoretical equations, fine. Show what's wrong in the equation. Don't tell me it's not in the books. That's nonsense. This is new. And you have to believe in yourself. And when you grow up and you have children, and you want them to believe in themselves, hug them. Mm -hmm. Hug your children. Show them that you love them all the time. And then they will be grow up with self-confidence. And resilience. You know, my promotions were delayed. Um, the Technion consulted with professors around the world. Should we promote Professor Schechtman to a higher degree? And some of the answers said, well, we don't know about the Technion and what are your standards, but in our university, no way. So my promotions were delayed, and this is called uh, resilience. This is uh, what I think that uh, happened, and this is why really the discovery waited for me. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for giving us a very inspiring lecture and very comprehensive uh, overview of your research and very interesting story behind your great discovery. Uh, I'm sure that all the people in this hall have enjoyed his lecture very much, right? <laughs> so uh, now uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, students uh, professors and researchers in this room have some questions on his research and his life as a Nobel laureate. So if you have any question, please raise your hand and Steph will bring you the microphone. And if you have any question, and, uh, please uh, introduce yourself briefly and ask your question. Oh, over there. Hello, professor. I am a graduate student in Fourth Tech. You don't see who is asking? Ah, me. me. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your lecture. It was very uh, interesting and fun. So I want to ask uh, some questions, but uh, I want to ask you first that is there any change, big changes that before and after you have Nobel Prize in your life? So how did my life change during that period of time? I can tell you that my life changed dramatically <laughs> after the Nobel. I can also that the life of other Nobel laureates also changed dramatically. Because suddenly, although I talk about myself, I was known in the world of people that worked on subjects like me, and we met in conferences and so on. But when you receive the Nobel Prize, 
the whole world knows about you, and they even invite you to post tech sometimes at all. <laughs> so, in normal years, normal years means before Corona, I gave 30, I gave a lecture in 30 cities around the world every year. Every year, 30 cities around the world. And each meeting is not just a talk. It's like here in Postdex, our events, our, it's all kinds of things. Every year, I was flying around the world all the time. This is one change. It has an effect of my family. I have 12 grandchildren, four children, one wife, and it affected, <laughs> it affected the life of everybody. For better sometimes, for worse. I can give you an example. My, my little son is a professor now at the Technion. I retired and he became a professor. He's a physicist. And we made sure that it is not known that he is my son. Because other people say, ah, okay, his father pushed him. No. He won everything by his own merit. It's his job. It's his work. He's very talented and he's very good. But we made sure that we keep distance in the formal setting of the university. So much so that his professor, with whom he did his PhD, who is a good friend of mine, did not know that he is my son. We have the same name. But the name Shechtman, you find it everywhere. Not very, com not, not very common, but not very rare either. He didn't know. We made sure that nobody knows. So this is also an effect, okay, that affects the family. And there are many, there are many other effects. When, when I'm away on travels, it's more difficult for the family. I'm not home. Sometimes I take my wife. Other times, whenever she wants, she's with me. Other times I don't. So it's, it changes the life setting of, of the university, not necessarily for worse, but also not completely good. So, and then there is a price, which is a, a, a lot of money for some people, of course, also for me, which you can spend on good things like education for your family, things like this. So yes, it does, it does make a lot of difference. And there are meetings in which Nobel laureates meet around the world. And the most famous one is the Lindau Conference in Germany. And hopefully, some of you will go there when you are in your higher studies. It's a meeting in which uh, Nobel laureates meet students. Number of Nobel laureates between 30 to 50. Number of students, 600. Selected. Each country, like Korea, sends 10, Israel sends 7, and so on and so forth. And these are the best of the best students in the world. So this is where we meet. So ma many changes occur. Okay, I will stop here. There are more stories, but other people may want to ask. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I can take one more question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I want to ask you, when you enter the graduate school, you have to choose your on research area, uh, how did you choose your research area? Oh. How? How did I choose to work on that element, on that material? Uh, no. Yes, oh, maybe based on your uh, interest or... Okay. So how was I interested in my research area? You know, this is a long story and it has many eye openings if, if I discuss this, but it will take a long time. It's a very, very serious question because it applies to each and every one of you. And I can tell you that I chose this subject by chance. And you will discover in your life that most of your chances are purely chance. You marry somebody because you just happen to meet him or her. Is this the best partner in the world for you? Of course not. But you can live together and have fun and have life and children. So, it, it's all chance. But to answer directly your question, I was 
I, I told this story, by the way, during lunchtime, so I'll be very, very brief about it. In one point in my career, I consulted a, sci a very prominent scientist, what's next in science, in material science? And I'm not sure I'm answering your question from the beginning, but I will, I will go back later on. He said rapid solidification. So I started to work on rapid solidification, and the discovery was done of rapidly solidified aluminum manganese alloy. This is rapid solidification. It was sponsored by DARPA. DARPA is the defense agency in the United States that sponsored studies. And uh, the subject, I, my proposal was about developing aluminum transition metal alloys for aviation. And I did that. But you see, we scientists, we cheat. What does it mean? It means that I started to prepare rapidly solidified alloys of aluminum manganese. Only, only binary alloys. Ternaries are too complex. Binary alloys, two elements. Aluminum, 1%. Manganese, 2%. 5%. This can be useful. 10%, not useful. 15, 20, 25, 35. Nonsense! This is powder. It, 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 it shatters in your hand. But there was a discovery. So what did we do? We, yes, I did what I promised to do, to develop alloys. And the one, two, three, five were possibly useful. And I made many other ones. This is just one example. But I continued. Because it was scientifically interesting, although not practically useful. Now, I would like to answer a question going far back. I never wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. And this is based on a book that I read, that maybe some of you have read it, by Jules Verne, the French writer, called Mystery Island. It's a book for children mainly. And I read when I was a child. And the hero there is an engineer. And I wanted to be an engineer. And this is why, after my military service in Israel, in Israel you go to military service and then to university, I studied mechanical engineering at the Technion, my university. Graduated in 1966. But 1966 was a big recession in Israel and I could not find a job. Is it bad when you don't find a job? Well, depends on what you do with it. So I said, well, I will do my master's degree, get some salary as a TA, teaching assistant, and in two years I will find a job, which I did. But during these two years of my master's degree, I fell in love with science and decided that I am going to be a scientist and continued for my PhD. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your answer. And I believe that uh, there will be a lot of questions from the audience, but because of the time constraint, I have to stop here. And dear postdoc students, my fellow professors and researchers, uh, let us express our warmest gratitude and respect to Professor Dan Schutman with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>